Let's face it, business technology is frustrating and complex. So how do you make sure it works for your team? To make IT right, start the discussion at go-domain.com. You're listening to Discussions by Domain, a podcast for business leaders. Our discussions may be with people you've probably heard of before, but the majority of our guests are in the trenches, professionals like you and I, with the same challenges and struggles of keeping up in the Northeast. They're implementing strategies, overcoming hurdles. They're leading the fastest growing businesses in our region. My name is Anthony DeGraw, Director of Partnerships at Domain Computer Services and the host of this show. When I'm not talking with business leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of Domain and the ups and downs of our own growth journey as we intend to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome to another episode of Discussions by Domain. Today I have Sean Dedine. He's the managing partner of the Axel Group. He has a phenomenal story. He's also a fellow Rutgers grad and wrestler which uh, I have a lot of respect for that as well. Uh, Sean's going to be talking to us today about the candidate experience throughout the hiring process. And Sean, behind the scenes a little bit, at Domain and in the IT industry specifically, you probably know this already, but getting talent and keeping talent is probably the hardest thing to do. Sure. And uh, and across, we're, we're part of a peer group and everything like that. We go get together every quarter. Every single managed service provider that we are is having this exact issue. Right. Right. So it's a great time. I know the IT industry isn't the only industry facing this. So sure. I'm pumped to have you on. Before we get into the topic, though, tell me a little bit about yourself and what you guys are up to at the Axel Group. Yeah. So my company, like you said, is a staffing and recruiting firm, but we focus in the AE and C industry. So all of our clients are either architects, engineers, construction management firms, okay. or real estate development firms. Um, and we really help them find professional level staff. We actually just opened up a separate division of our company to help uh, with the support services of those companies. So okay. we found ourselves a lot of companies calling us saying, hey, I know you don't do this, but, and the buts were administrative staff, marketing staff, human resources staff, accounting and finance staff. So we've been able to help some of our clients because we know their culture and we know that industry really well, yeah. uh, add some staff on the support side. So we opened up a division. We have a, a woman who works for me, Deanna Sagaty, who actually we just promoted. She's been with us for about 18 months, has a little bit of a background in that kind of staffing. Awesome. And so it was like a perfect segue into that to be more well-rounded and support our clients. Yeah. No, that's great stuff. So I'm someone who has no idea about the staffing <laughs> sure. industry, right? I have friends that work in it and the Robert Halfs of the world and all yeah, of this. Yeah. I know it's a start for a lot of people, uh, but for somebody that has no idea, how do you guys specifically help businesses with this entire, there's a, there's multiple realms of the staffing sure. industry. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that uh a client could utilize our services, right? There's yeah. temporary staffing where there's a set period of time the person's going to be used. There's the direct placement, which pretty much everybody knows, which is like your headhunter fee. Okay, yeah. Um, you go out and identify talent, and then there's kind of a try-before-you-buy method in the middle of contract to hire. So it really depends on what the best model is for that client. So we'd sit down and kind of talk through what their business looks like, how they're trying to add talent, what the particular reason is. And from there, we put together a search strategy that would okay. allow us to go into the market and look for that talent from a competitor, um, from someone that's doing the job today, and really try to attract someone that's not going to be applying to a job posting, not going to be looking at your company. I mean, think about how busy you are on a daily basis, right? Yeah. You, you have family, you got life, you got social life, you got some responsibilities and hobbies. And it's really tough for people to dedicate the time working from you know 8 to 6 o'clock and social life and family to go do research on companies that are looking for them. 100%. So talk, go a little bit deeper on that. So specifically, we say that the best people aren't looking for jobs and sure. we know that, right? Sure. We know our best people aren't looking for jobs. Right. They're being the best at what they do. Sure. So talk to me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So I came from a, a really large staffing company. I worked there for about five and a half years after okay. college, after I wrestled at Rutgers. Mm -hmm. And they have this huge proprietary software that's that's really great for their business. Okay. And we always recruited out of that. And when I started my own staffing firm, one of the things that I was curious about was how are we going to identify talent? Are we, we didn't, I didn't have the money when I started my company <laughs> yeah. you know, by myself to go out and buy a software. So um, kind of old school going through LinkedIn and different um, networking groups to identify names of people and then just 
literally giving them a call and kind of getting to know them. So okay. we eliminated from the recruiting role, um, you know, I've seen through a bunch of different companies that I've worked with in the past and that I've gotten to know people that have worked there. The recruiter has a lot of things they need to do on a daily basis okay. other than just recruit talent and screen talent. Yeah. And we've taken all that off of their plate. Our recruiters are only responsible for identifying and screening talent. And it allows them to just be more efficient in going into the market. And that's another reason we focus in the AENC industry. We want to be experts at what we do. I, yeah. I don't want to go place an IT person on Monday and <laughs> an accounting person on Tuesday and then a construction worker on you know Wednesday. Yeah. I want to focus in the AENC industry and I want the people we hire to focus on architecture, engineering, construction. And then Deanna, obviously, like I mentioned before, she's going to focus on back office and, and support staff for your business. Okay. And this way we can build up a pool of candidates. Yeah, and you're becoming that niche expert in that field. And I think from there, developing more trust with your customers. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the people, the candidates we're talking to are traditionally either at an event or at their desk in a lot of cases, sitting there passively happy at their jobs. But we talk to them and kind of find out what they want. Like I've had scenarios where a gentleman had, uh, him and his wife were got pregnant with triplets oh. and he drove an hour to and from work. So all of a sudden life situation happens. He can't travel that far to work yeah. anymore. He needs a lot more flexibility. We're able to look for things closer to the area. In some cases they got passed over for a promotion or um, there's maybe a glass ceiling based on the tenure of some people in front of them, things like that. So we really want to get to know our candidates, what's driving them and then try to you know, improve that situation if we can. Yeah, no, that's that's super interesting. Uh, you you mentioned uh, your wrestling career, and I know yeah. that has a lot to do with what you got going on. So sure. tell me a little bit about that and what's going on at Rutgers as well in yeah. the wrestling. Yeah, so I mean, I started wrestling when I was four years old. Um, kind of, I think my parents, I just had a ton of energy. And I, I always was told that by my father, but I have a three-year-old son now. Yeah. And he's like a maniac. Like if he was here right now, he'd be jumping off the table trying to like leg drop. Me. Yeah. And uh, he's a lot of fun. So he has a ton of energy and they put me into wrestling just to kind of burn some of that off. And then I took to it and um, it kind of carried me through my whole life. And, you know, when I got to, you know, past college and finally figure out what I want to do, I had no clue what I wanted to do after college. Like I really, yeah. everyone says that, but really didn't know. Yeah. And sales, which is, Recruiting and staffing is generally a sales-driven job. Yeah. It's exactly like wrestling. On the wrestling mat, you don't have to know anything about the sport other than it's one versus one and a ref. It doesn't matter if mom's on the PTA, dad's the coach, yeah. <laughs> this person's someone's uncle. Yeah, There's no opinion. You and me are going to wrestle. One person's going to win, and that tells the story of, of who's better. Yeah. And so in sales, the numbers usually dictate the story. So I took to that right away. They they paid you more based on more how you did, yeah. the effort you put in. I liked that. And so I took to this. But wrestling-wise, I mean, Rutgers was an amazing experience. We had – I was part of uh, the head coach there now, Scott Goodale, and Coach Leonardis, his assistant coach. They're still there. I was part of their first recruiting class. Awesome. Uh, I transferred in from another school and was lucky enough to get there for three years. And we uh, – they, I don't believe we were ever ranked in the country as a team except for like in the 70s for like a week. Yeah, no. Uh, we finished as a team number 21 as a, my junior year and number uh, nine as a dual meet team my senior year. Had some really great roommates that went on to do some really cool That's things awesome. in wrestling. So the the discipline to work out at that level and be focused and then also hold up your responsibilities socially and for your family and for your friends um, while competing at that level really – helps translate into the business world because you got a lot of responsibility. Yeah, and especially as an entrepreneur. I mean, you, you're you just, you're fighting every single day yeah, to no. stay alive. <laughs> you got employees now and everything yeah. like that, and you guys have been doing great. Let's go over to uh, specifically this topic now on candidate experience through the hiring process. Sure. When when we connected before this interview, you just started going off on this topic, and I was like, "We know what the topic is. This is this <laughs> sure. is awesome." So I, I I guess I'd like to start with what do what are companies getting wrong in their hiring process? Um, I guess off the bat, if you don't have someone dedicated to what that looks like for your company, you know, I think it's pretty funny when I talk to a lot of companies and the amount of money they'll spend on different things, but they won't spend money to attract the top talent, which is going to deliver their product and interface with their client and, and whoever's buying their product. So from the get-go, there has to be someone that's dedicated to this process, whether that's someone in human resources. In a perfect world, your human resources individual is partnered with someone on the leadership team of the company because it's going to be you know, that individual in human resources, they're excellent at a lot of different things, but they're not 
always interfacing with the client. They're not selling your product. They're not Correct. out on the you know ground floor kind of doing that. And so mm-hmm. to have someone involved that is going to be managing the people that you hire, working day to day with the people that you hire is very important in addition to that. So I think from the get-go, you got to have someone dedicated and, yeah. and make it a priority. And then it's about the experience from the second that candidate walks into the door till you know, you're finished with uh, the interview process from you know, walking in and how you're greeted at the front door to you know, what your lobby looks like to the first appearance of your building. And then when someone comes out and greets you, how long you're sitting there waiting, how excited that person is that you're here, yeah. do they offer you something to drink, sit you down. Uh, and then the people that are interviewing, you know, interviewing is a skill on both sides, on the candidate side and on the client side. So really getting your energetic people there that are passionate about your business and that, you know, really are driving what you guys are trying to accomplish. Yeah. It's very important to be in the interview process. Gotcha. So how did we do when you came Pretty here? good. No, <laughs> I, got a, I got a glass of water. I was showing where the restroom was if I needed it. Um, I got brought in here, so it, you know, met Ty. So it, yeah. it was it was a very good experience, and you guys have a really nice lobby, and so all of that plays a part because right now in the market that we're in, the candidate is really driving um, the experience because it's up to them if they want the job. There's a shortage of qualified people, yeah. and it's extremely difficult to attract talent. So if your company is not taking every step possible to really, I can't tell you, I could have a whole separate. A business on people that have gotten job offers and declined them. Yeah, <laughs> you know, from from a variety of reasons. So no, it's funny you mentioned that. I, uh, I, I, you probably have seen it because you're more in the space than I am. But there's been like this LinkedIn post that's going around and can, people are sharing it and whatnot. Sure. And it's like a recruiter to a CEO conversation. Yeah. And uh, eventually, it's like you took four weeks to give the person an offer. Meanwhile, they had six offers on the table. Yes. You know? it, it, that all comes down to relationship, right? Because yeah. that person is. Uh, in that scenario, that person's focused on their business. And so sometimes, you know, my business and people in my world get to the bottom of their to-do list okay. and, and you don't get back to them. So it comes down to where my relationship is with that individual and how important it is to them to really attract this talent. Because not everybody will say this to their client, right? You really need to be forward to give your client the best experience yeah. because if you coach them up and say, hey, this is what the market's demanding right now. This is what your competitors are doing to attract talent. This is what their experience is at other places. If they come in here and they're waiting for 15 minutes in the lobby and then they're waiting for 20 minutes in the conference room and then you're rushed because you're running late and your partner who's supposed to be with you walks in five minutes later and they're sitting there quiet and there's it's just a question answer. What the hell is going on here? They don't get a, yeah, they don't get a great experience. Why are they going to leave their job and, and risk the devil they do for the devil they don't in a sense yeah you know without you know good experience no that's that's good stuff uh to to flip it over to the candidate side what can sure. candidates do to make themselves look better or be more prepared for these types of interviews yeah so from that perspective we spend a lot of time with our recruiters you know prepping them and teaching them how to give people advice on different interview scenarios because yeah. like i mentioned before it is a little bit of a skill but at the same time you know not everybody goes on interviews every day. I mean, I don't know when the last time you went on an interview. Three personally. years ago. Yeah. So, and <laughs> I was sitting in this chair right yeah, here. <laughs> so, and hopefully you didn't have to go on 50 interviews to get nah, the job, right? Yeah. So people don't get a lot of practice at this thing. Yeah. Um, so it's all the little things, I think, that our clients are looking for. Are you dressed properly? Are you there on time? Are you prepared with you know, your resume and your portfolio and maybe a couple of questions that the person has asked? Mm-hmm. Are you engaged in the conversation? Are you, did you do research prior to the, you know, the interview on the company and on the individual? If you have the individual's name, did you do some research on them? And then follow up from that, just how you're keeping communication. Do you send them a thank you note at the end, whether it's handwritten or whether it's, you know, an email, everybody's, you know, virtual nowadays. So send it the email. Thank you. I think those things are what's going to separate you from your competition because generally speaking, not all the time, but generally speaking. If you're at the table for an interview, you have some of the skills that that company is looking for on paper. Yeah. And then it's all about the intangibles, right? Are you going to are you going to elevate the level of employee that we have internally? Are you going to move us forward and are you going to help us get where we're trying to go? And those little yeah. things tell that story. No, and it, it matches up so much. We 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 have a lot of deep conversations here is about sales and marketing sure. and whatnot. And I always say to the people here, I'm like 
they wouldn't have reached out to us if they didn't think we had the competency to right. get the job done. 100%. Now let's go talk to them about who we are as a company. We've kind of already sold ourselves in the services and everything we're doing through the website and sure. social media and all these things. Like we, it, obviously they want to know the technical skills we have, but it's the same right. thing you just mentioned here. Like if you got to that seat at that table yeah. to have that interview, you've done pretty good up to that point. Yeah, it's kind of table yeah. stakes at that point, right? And now the difference is, do I like the individual? Do they fit into my culture? Are they going to elevate the you know, level yeah. of employee that we have? And then are they going to drive our business forward? That's awesome. All right, let's, let's keep going here. So those are some of the things that uh, companies get wrong, right? Sure. What are some of the immediate things or small things they can do to help improve this, right? You're not going to change it overnight right. uh, unless engaging with somebody like yourself, but sure. like, what are some immediate things they can do to start making this process better? I, I think if you just want to make it better just from an immediate, like from today till tomorrow, yeah. commun dedicating someone to the process and having them okay. communicate efficiently. I think... You know, you mentioned it before, like, hey, this that the thing that was going on LinkedIn, like people didn't get back to them for four weeks. I think, you know, getting back to somebody in a 24-hour window with an email that says, hey, can you do such and such time and such and such date is a pretty simple task. Yeah. I think dedicating someone to doing that and sending an email from your phone. I mean, every single person has their phone on them a majority of the day, Correct. Um, if not all the time. So sending an email from your phone to try to look at your calendar and coordinate a time uh, to do something as efficient. So just being efficient with communication is the first step to you know, improving okay. the process. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that too. So we, we addressed all that. I'd like to flip the script a little bit and sure. get, a, get a little bit more personal. Okay. How can people know Sean a little bit better? Uh -oh. And we talked a little bit about wrestling and whatnot. Sure. But uh, if you were to go back to, I want to say your wrestling days, right? You were like, I, I didn't know uh, what I was going to do truly yeah. and whatnot. What advice, now that you're sitting where you are, would you give that younger self? It's a really good, interesting question. I think the, the first thing that comes to my mind is I would set bigger goals. Okay. I, I think I was afraid at a even even as recently as when I opened my business two years ago. I think I was afraid to to have too big of a goal as far as I didn't know if I could accomplish it. So if I set this goal and I don't reach it, right, I'm a failure. Yeah. And in reality, that's a goal that I made. That if I don't reach it, then I'm, am I a failure or am I a success for working my tail off and trying to reach it? And changing that mindset and really going out there and really telling people what my actual goals are. The goals that you tell yourself and like when no one's around and you know that you're listening to music while you're working out, like yeah, that goal. Because yeah. every time I've set a goal, not every time, but a lot of the times I've set a goal, I've been able to achieve that. And a good example is in high school, I wanted to be a state qualifier. Okay. My freshman year of high school in wrestling, I didn't win any varsity matches. My senior year, I qualified for the states. I lost first round. There was no wrestle backs at that time. So I hit my goal. Yeah. But I, Looking backwards, if my goal was to be a state place winner, I probably would have been a state place winner. Yeah. And if, you know, uh, my goal was to be a state champ. I might have been a state champ, but my goal was to wrestle a match in Atlantic City where they have the state tournament. Yeah. I wrestled the match in Atlantic City, so I hit my goal, but it could have been bigger. And yeah. so, uh, you know, I think just the advice would be to set bigger goals and not be afraid to fall a little short, but you know, really yeah. go chase them. Exactly. Uh, real quick, where did you wrestle in high school? I wrestled at Central Regional High School. Central down, Regional. Down okay. Tom Trevor, yeah. yeah. I think you were uh, part of our group. Uh, I was Point Borough. So oh, yeah. I, I think we're in the same group, yeah, but I'm we, not 100% uh, sure. Yeah, uh, South same, too or something? Same division, yep. We used to wrestle at Point, at Point Borough all the time under the lights. They showed all the lights down. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. yeah, I was at all those matches. A lot of yeah. good friends there. Maybe we'll, we'll reconnect after this. Yeah, and that see was if a good rivalry. Names. Yeah. Okay, cool. My next question, and we were talking about podcasts before we started recording. Sure. Uh, before podcasts, it was always books for me. Still right. is books, but I have a four-year-old son as well uh, who likes to elbow drop me <laughs> and, uh, and a two-year-old daughter, so I don't get too much time with books now. But sure. what is a book out there that has either uh, changed your thought process the most or maybe you've gifted to other people the most? Yeah, um, so my, my, my father-in-law, if he was here, he would love this question because I hated – reading. Like yeah. I, didn't, I didn't read growing up. I didn't read in high school. I really didn't read in college. And I got into reading, you know, right after college. And I loved books that were about the person's life and their struggle to become successful. Yeah. And so my first book I ever read was actually like really read from cover to cover was Jay-Z's book Decoded okay. about his life story and how he became to write music and, you know, how he's become successful now. But probably to answer that question more directly would be Nick Saban's book, Okay. Um, about his coaching career and kind of him growing up in a small town in West Virginia. And now he's arguably the best college football coach ever of all time. Yeah. And kind of the standard of which he holds his people and like 
how his philosophy on coaching and you know being able to hold yourself really accountable to a very high standard. Yeah, I, that's a great one. I haven't read that one yet, but I those books, those types of book as well is like Tim. We were talking about Tim Ferriss a yeah. little bit before, but one of his questions is always like. Everybody always sees the success, and he obviously has a sure. ton of successful people on there that have done amazing things. He's like, "Tell me about your failures. Yeah. Tell me about the normal person that is there and what had to get there." And no that uh, reminds me of his story too. Yeah, it's kind of. I mean, that's any book that you read. I mean, I just recently read a book called Molly's Game. Okay. And uh, it's about this woman who was growing up. Her and her brothers were super competitive skiers. There's a movie they just made about it too. Okay. And long story short, she fell short of her goal. She got hurt. She didn't make the Olympic team. She moves out to LA and gets involved in this poker game. She ends up running this like poker game with like oh, a couple yeah, hundred yeah, thousand yeah, dollars yeah, yeah. a hand oh. every night. And just how she got involved in this and how she was able to manage this game with such big names and big people. And even though it was illegal, just the story behind it was in, insane. And they did, there's another book called uh, Who Thought This Was a Good Idea about this woman, Alyssa, and her last name's escaping me, but okay. she was the first female chief of, chief of staff for okay. a president. She was uh, Barack Obama's chief of staff. And the work ethic of this woman to like provide the service that he needed to be successful was insane. So I really love the, the stories of yeah. these people, you know, how they came up from, you know, very modest beginnings to where they are. Yeah, no, that's good stuff. And we'll have Ty linked to all those books in the show notes too. Cool. So we'll direct people right to them. Nice. Uh, final question. Uh, we've talked a decent amount about wrestling. I know you give it back a ton of your time to the wrestling community. Yeah. Tell me how that impacts the kids that you're working with and some of the services you're giving them. I volunteer coach at the high school at Shore Regional High School uh, okay. in West Long Branch. Yep. And, uh, last year actually was the first year they ever won a state sectional wrestling title in wrestling. That's awesome. Yeah, so we have a really good crew of kids there that have come up through the rec program. And I got involved with them late and moved to West Long Branch several years ago. I okay. just moved out of West Long Branch. But um, right next to the high school, wanted to give back to wrestling and kind of got involved with this team. And when I was growing up, I didn't really have the easiest go uh, from a personal standpoint. Yeah. We had some family issues growing up. And, you know, like everybody else has issues. Yeah. And I had a high school wrestling coach, Mike Bischoff, who's coach at Central Regional High School. Then uh, his boys actually wrestle for Southern Regional now. Okay. And, uh, you know, he kind of took – I was, remember I said I had zero wins as a freshman, right? So he got the job my sophomore year. Okay. We had never won a state title in wrestling. I think the school as a whole, Central Regional, hasn't won a state sectional title in anything outside of maybe one year in bowling. Okay. Um, since like 2005 and six, And we won two state titles. And this guy, I didn't win any matches, and like he took me under his wing, and like I was having a little bit of a tough time in school and personal life. And yeah, he looked out for me when there was really no, there was no benefit. Then I wasn't the best wrestler on the team. Correct. Wasn't yeah. the best kid. Yeah. And he just looked out for me because it looked like I needed someone to care about me a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And it kind of changed the trajectory of my life. Him along with my father and my father-in-law have really helped that. And so being able to go back to wrestling and like connect with the kids and whether it's just practice and pushing them or if it's, you know, they have something going on at home and I can be talk to them. And yeah. we recently had an athlete who graduated who wrestles at Stevens Institute of Technology in New yeah. Jersey. He's an engineer. And I was able to get him an internship at one of my clients. That's a paid all, internship. That's so, awesome. Yeah. You know, it was awesome to be able to, you know, get to know him through high school. And now he's in college wrestling and going to school, getting great grades academically. Yeah. And then we get you're, him an internship. Yeah, you're setting up him on his career path. Yeah, that's it was amazing. really cool to help him. Well, I appreciate you doing that because that's uh, uh, similar to me uh, when the the people when you when you are nothing kind of at that younger age and yeah. you're going through those things. The people that give you give back are the ones that really set you up on the right course. No doubt, you know, uh, and they they keep you going in the positive path and not the negative path. For sure. So, really appreciate that. Yeah. Dude, Sean, thank you so much for coming on today, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun, man. Yeah. This is awesome. So Good stuff. Cool. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in iTunes or your favorite podcast player. This guarantees that every episode will get delivered directly to your device. To help us get the word out, share with a friend, leave a review, and check out our discussions on the web at go-domain.com slash podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.